Joining me now is the Democratic Congresswoman from California, Barbara Lee, and also with us is Democratic Congresswoman from Texas, Jasmine Crockett. Thank you to you both for being with me this morning. Congresswoman Lee, I want to start with you. There are a number of Democratic women. Uh, they, they, they wore white to the State of the Union address on Thursday in support of women's rights. President Biden has also nodded to women's electoral and political power in his remarks recently. Can you just talk about what the woman's vote and its movement is going to mean for 2024 in terms of who gets elected to the White House? Thanks a lot for having us this morning, Charles. Uh, first, the women's, women's vote, uh, it's huge. Uh, so many of the issues that uh, we have to deal with each and every day uh, as it relates to our march toward full equality are issues that are impacting uh, especially young women now. For example, uh, this is the first time a constitutional right has been taken away. And in fact, it was taken away as, as it relates to Roe uh, because Donald Trump appointed Supreme Court justices who decided that women should not have a right to make health care decisions over their body. And so I believe that uh, women are going to lead because so much of the impacts of Donald Trump in terms of negative impacts in terms of trying to turn the clock back have affected women and specifically women of color, low income women. And so this coalition that is put together, we're not going back. Uh, this is about making sure that young women especially understand the relationship between electing a Donald Trump and taking away uh, our rights. And uh, I think that is, you're going to see a groundswell of women leading, as you saw the other night on the floor of the House of Representatives during the State of the Union speech. We, women from all backgrounds, are banding together to make sure that we defeat Donald Trump and elect uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris. Congresswoman Crockett, I know that uh, you and your sorors are busy with uh, Delta Days on the Hill this, this, this week, so I want to thank you for taking the time to come be with us on Velshi today. Uh, I want to ask you, Republicans seem to understand, at least in theory, that they're at a disadvantage when it comes to issues like reproductive rights, and that may be one of the reasons why they chose Senator Britt to give the response to the State of the Union, but as we talked about during our last hour, it does not seem like that was a smart choice, if only for the difficult position that it put her in. Can you talk about your reaction to that response or that rebuttal and whether it was a good move by the GOP? No, I, I absolutely was thinking of that as you were talking to um, my colleague, Congresswoman Lee. You know, they are doing all the pandering that they can do, and that is specifically why they not only chose a woman, but they chose a woman from Alabama to give the rebuttal. And the problem was the Republicans have never cared or thought about women. If they did, then they would have known how tone deaf it was to put a woman in a kitchen and then have her senior colleague talk about how she's a housewife. I've got news for him. He's She's actually his colleague. And that tells you where their mindset is. He looks at her as a junior senator and all he sees is a housewife. He doesn't see a colleague. That's who the Republicans are. We will always be second-class citizens to them. And the fact that Molly John Fast just had to tell you the fact that, you know, these Republicans, when it comes to the votes, they're getting these white women. Wake up is all I got to say. I know that they want to tell y'all not to be woke, but I need y'all to be woke because honestly, IVF is going to have a disproportionate impact on those white suburban um, well-to-do women. And so maybe finally they will understand that the Democratic Party is the only party that is looking out for women as a whole, whether you are struggling financially or whether you are financially wealthy, we are the only ones that are looking out for you. I think that's a critical point because the IVF discussion is what takes the notion of class and access out of the reproductive rights conversation more so than it had been previously. People who were in areas where you could not get an abortion could travel or have access to abortion elsewhere. But if you're outlawing IVF now, you have the money to get that and you have the money to participate in that, it becomes a very different conversation for people who are looking to start a family. Congresswoman Lee, uh, on the other side, 
there is this issue that is dogging the president, particularly among young voters and progressives. They are deeply unhappy with America's policy regarding the war in Gaza and the fact that people there are continuing to suffer from famine, from large-scale violence against people who are largely innocent and caught in the middle of this. President Biden has addressed this with his red line with Israel during his speech with Jonathan Cahart. Let's listen to what he has to say. I want to get your reaction on the other side. What is your red line with Prime Minister Netanyahu? Do you have a, of a red line? For instance, would invasion of Rafa, which you have urged him not to do, would that be a red line? It is a red line, but I'm never going to leave Israel. The defense of Israel is still critical. So there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons so they don't have the Iron Dome to protect them. They don't have. But there's red lines that if he crosses and they can, he cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead. Congresswoman Lee, uh, listening to that, it seems like the president may be talking out of both sides of his mouth. He says, on one hand, I'm never going to leave Israel. But on the other hand, I do have a red line. Is that type of response going to be enough? Is there a way that he successfully somehow toes the line and is able to appease or attract uh, the young and progressive voters who have turned their backs on him because of this issue while still not alienating the, the people in America and the electorate who are extremely pro-Israel? Charles, I don't think it's about appeasing um, voters. This is a very uh, serious war that's taking place. Uh, of course, the president, myself, uh, we all have condemned the Hamas attacks. We all have uh, talked about uh, Israel not having to be living, living in a neighborhood where they're vulnerable to terrorism. And in fact, uh, the path to peace and security for Palestinians and Israelis is not through killing uh, 30,000 plus civilians. I have early on called for a permanent ceasefire. What's taking place um, is counterproductive to Israel's uh, security. Uh, and in fact, if, if we're gonna pipe and raise our voices to bring the hostages home and to stop the catastrophic uh, humanitarian disaster that's taking place, then we have in the public, uh, and I think people are speaking out because young people especially, and people in states who want to, this democracy to work, but also who want to see a political and diplomatic path to uh, a uh, ceasefire. Uh, we're going to continue to raise our voices about that. Finally, I'll just say what is taking place is escalating now into a regional war. And you may remember, uh, Charles, I said right after 9-11 that it was going to escalate out of control. And that's why I was the only one that voted against the authorization to use force right after the horrific events of 9-11. It did escalate out of control. The president has acknowledged that. Now the United States is more embroiled in the regional uh, war. So we've got to get to a permanent ceasefire. And I think the president uh, and, and the humanitarian catastrophe, we've got to get humanitarian aid in, but you can't send humanitarian aid in while at the same time you're going to continue to support the killing of civilians. So I think uh, with the public has got to uh, keep raising our voices and keep asking the president and saying to the president that we must stop the catastrophic disaster that's taking place because it definitely, and we know this, it is counterproductive to Israel's security and to a two-state solution, which of course Netanyahu uh, does not support, which is still the policy of the United States. Uh, Congresswoman Lee, though, is, is there is there a, a, a jumping off point, a split that comes with the notion of I'm never leaving Israel, but we need a ceasefire and we're in favor of a two-state solution, which Prime Minister Netanyahu is not in favor of. It seems like that's a collision course at some point. Is there any sort of reconciliation for those positions to exist together? Now, I think what the United States has to do and the Biden-Harris administration needs to be very firm in terms of using our leverage. Uh, the United States is very influential in the region. I'm the ranking member, uh, Charles, of the committee. And when we were in the majority, I was the chair of the committee on appropriation that funds a lot of our international, global uh, development, humanitarian assistance uh, investments. So I know the region very well. Met with King Abdullah of Jordan a couple of weeks ago, and there's a, a peace plan that they're trying to put together. Uh, and so I believe that the president has got to use the leverage of the United States and say this has got to stop. And yes, we're, we support Israel's security. I mean, everyone 
who's talking about a mm -hmm. ceasefire is not talking about leaving uh, uh, Israel vulnerable to terrorist attacks. But as the president said, there, there are ways you prosecute a war, uh, address terrorism, and, and dismantle and disrupt a terrorist organization without killing so many uh, civilians. So many people in our own country have relatives. I know someone who has over 100 relatives who were killed. Civilians can't be collateral damage in a war uh, to address uh, dismantling of a terrorist organization. Thank you to you both, Congresswoman Bob Barbara Lee, Democrat of California, and Representative Jasmine Crockett. Uh, you have fun with your sorrows on Delta Days on the Hill. Just don't do too much.